You're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. Visit bpn.fm to discover more. Hello, I'm Jesse McAnally. And I am Andrew DeWolf. And I'm Liz Eston. And welcome to Musicals with Cheese, a podcast where I try to get Andrew and Liz to like musical theater. And it's an ooky spooky episode this week because it's October and I just really wanted to talk about this show. So now it's spooky. <laughs> um, oh my God. Yeah, I didn't at, think it was that scary, bats, but it is now. The bat sounds and, you know, the organ music and the lightning strikes and all of those. Um, yep. But today we are joined by our ooky spooky guest, who you will remember from the incredible YouTube series Sideways. It's e- Ethan from Sideways. Hello. I got I got very scared it's, there. The thought of bats very frightening. Bats are oh, terrifying. That is bats Fine. are so scary. You know what's so, like like gods bats gargoyles. What? What? How are those gods bats? Because yeah, that's like a bats, they bats, got wings. Those were invented and, by Disney uh, in the nineties. <laughs> which <laughs> they which, have musical numbers. They come to life. <laughs> They're not good musical numbers. I'm going to be a gargoyle defender in this episode, which Ooh. not for the movie, but for this. A guy ah, like you, okay. kid. You You're like something special. <laughs> Thank you. I was like, you look like a, every time I see it, you look like a croissant. I'm like, how hard did they have to work to put that in? <laughs> Just croissant. 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 <laughs> um, I can see the angry internet person saying, you've already covered the hunchback of Notre Dame. Well, no, we haven't. Oh, well. You are uh-huh. incorrect. Today, we are covering Disney's Der Glockner von Notre Dame. <laughs> But Der Gluckner von Notre Dame, or in English, The Bell Ringer of Notre Dame, is a musical written and directed by James Lapine and with music and lyrics by Alan Menken and Stephen Schwartz, respectively. The original musical premiered in 1999 in Berlin, Germany as Der Gluckner von Notre Dame. It was produced by Disney Theatrical Productions, the company's first musical to premiere outside the U.S. It ran for a whopping three years, becoming one of Berlin's longest-running musicals and didn't transfer to Broadway ever and only came to America (laughs) in 2014 and in a much worse version um the plot of which we already covered that we did um and basically it was just me bitching about it not being this the plot of which is a deformed bell ringer must assert his independence from a vicious government minister in order to help his friend uh romani dancer um yeah so this is gonna be an interesting episode where basically it's me begging people to look deeper into the, <laughs> the, the the original Berlin production of The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Because now that the Patrick Page, Michael Arden, I, I believe it's 2014 or 2015 production that was played at the Paper Mill Playhouse and the La Jolla Playhouse, um, that has become the more well-known version. And I, I think, think that's the one that I've like experienced in the past because I just I don't remember German. That's perfectly fine. I don't mm. that sh- that is did some good things. It didn't remove a lot of the good things that this did, but I mm. think James Lapine's approach to this story and approach to the direction of this is so much better <laughs> than anything they tried to do in any previous or hereafter productions that mm-hmm. it makes me angry. <laughs> um, I, I will I will say this, right? Like as far as Disney or like stage adaptations of Disney movies, especially in the Renaissance, you know, you're talking mm. Aladdin, Beauty and the Beast, Little Mermaid, Lion King. This one is like one of, if not the best I've seen. It might, it might be my favorite now. Um, it was really, really impressive. Like, I don't want to jump ahead too much. Go, but like, go, go ahead. Like, no, no, go, like, go, yeah, ahead. go jump. One, one of the, one of the big problems is you could really see the stuffing in a lot of the other ones where it's like, ah, oh, here's, here's a musical number that wasn't in the movie. And it's kind of like, Eh, whatever. But with this one, like if you weren't familiar with the film, everything would really blend together really, really seamlessly. And th- and I think that was done like extremely well. Mm. I think mm. a big part of that is Europe puts money into its theater <laughs> and a lot of it. <laughs> and they value it 
such as a commodity. Like we've mm-hmm. that has become a recurring theme in our podcast is we will be so whiny about like these cheap looking Broadway productions and things that mm-hmm. look borderline like community theater. And then we watch one thing from Europe and we're like, what you can do this? You can do well, specifically things? Europe that isn't England. England is also cheap, but in a different kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> it's I, it's it's mostly like France and Germany, and Germany, and like these, like these countries, and they have like impressive theater productions. And then uh, the English-speaking countries, we get a uh, trash. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think it's kind of like I think it's kind of like that that mega musical vibe where a lot of times I'll see contemporary musicals and it feels like they're trying to be more cinematic. Yes, you know, like they're really trying to compete with film. But in, I mean, at least from what I've seen in a lot of places in Europe, they're like they they don't have any qualms about it being theater. Like they're unapologetically like this is the stage and we know how to use it. But that's what you have to do. Yeah, because exactly. if you if you want it to compete with a movie, you have to lean into the medium mm-hmm, and like mm-hmm. make it immersive in that way. Because you're not going to be immersive in the same way a, a flat movie screen is. You're Absolutely. just going to look flat. Absolutely, <laughs> like without question. And that's, that is what happens with a lot of Broadway shows. Like we've mm-hmm. covered, we, when we covered the the uh, American one of the Hunchback of Notre Dame, it was like it was, the set was very flat and mm-hmm. boring, if I remember correctly. Yes, yeah. it was literally just the floor of Notre Dame and nothing. Everything was interpretive. Like they would use instead of like water, they would use like a paper mache piece and things like that. Like then they would have actors represent like pieces and objects and sets rather than Mm -hmm, any mm -hmm. it was very interpretive very for the score that it had it felt very underwhelming where this has visuals and staging that lives up to such a grandiose score and i think well andrew what do you think is the biggest differences aside from the aesthetics between this and the american production i mean it's hard to not talk about the aesthetics but I guess I mean there's there is story changes if we want to get into that and yeah. I like a lot of the story changes. Mm-hmm. Um they make it a little more adult a little bit? Yes, but I like that it's just a little bit. My biggest problem with the American version is they it almost becomes like wallowing in the misery a bit. This mm. is like mature but children could still like you could still bring a family to it i think yeah it wouldn't be like yeah. too much yeah it's not alienating but it does like it the big they keep the dark ending esmeralda still dies at the end mm-hmm. um and it's still like that emotional catharsis is still there but on the other hand we still have the gargoyles they're toned down significantly but they're yeah. there significantly <laughs> significantly <laughs> So and I don't, I don't remember. They don't sing the song, do they? They do. I don't they, they, do. They, do. they do. They do. They do. Do they? Yeah. They say it, croissant. It's very awkward. I in may German. not have recognized it in the German. <laughs> and it, I'm so used to the English version of it. It's good because it's the opening of Act Two, and I don't know if you remember what they did in the American version, but I hate that song so much that I welcome. Oh fuck! It's been so long since I've seen the American version. It was a song called "Flight into Egypt" about um a saint that was beheaded, and the joke is his head kept falling off. And it just doesn't work, and it has no emotional connection to Quasi. At least this has a deep-rooted thematic connection to the overall narrative. Um, Fair enough. But huh. yes, yeah, so I let's come, so let's start with comparisons to the original film. Ethan, mm-hmm. what is the biggest differences between Der Glocke der Van Notre Dame and the animated film? Oh, well, one is animated, the other one's people. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a big that one. Was a good, that's good a good call. call. Good call. So I almost didn't catch that. So yeah, the, <laughs> I thought it was animated the whole time. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, the the thing is, is whenever whenever I look at one of these stage adaptations, there's a really there's a really weird fine line that you have to thread where you're you want to be as close to the film as possible when you can, but you also want to lean into theater as hard as you can when you know that you can't do what films do. Um. And something that I found really, really impressive was the arrangement of all of the music in this score. Mm -hmm. Um, So when you're working with film, right, when you're working with anything that has any kind of access to post-production, you can rebalance all the instruments. You can rebalance all the voices. You can copy one person and make them sound like 10. You can have you can have violins drown out brass instruments. Right. You can have a solo flute like like outshadow an entire brass section, entire horn section. 
I could, and normally when you see live performances of that kind of music, especially in like a musical theater situation where you're dealing with a smaller ensemble, you see a lot of like orchestration issues, a lot of just problems with the arrangement. I only saw like two, maybe three instances where I was like, oh, I guess that doesn't really work. Um, the way that they compensated for the film score and put that into the show was like really impressive. It was really great. Um, so we're they talking about great job keeping um, all the songs sounding really huge, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, especially like uh, just like the opening number when they when they go way way up at the end and yeah. like it's still you can still like feel it even though that would be like hell to perform live every night. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, so one of the things that they did that I noticed was especially in like Hellfire, which is always an amazing number. Um, but again, in the opening and the, in the closing number, um, there's a lot more emphasis on lower voices. And I noticed that they included a lot more strength in, in the soprano lines and the, in the upper voices. And it gave for a fuller sound, which was better live. Um, which isn't necessarily something you have to do and you could just change it in the mix. So like mm-hmm. just little tweaks like that. It, it, it's, it's, you really see the polish, you know, like you see the polish in the places that most people aren't going to be looking. And so it's just, it was really nice. It was really, really nice. I love this. I, I love you, Ethan. You are wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> my God. I could hear you talk for about this for hours. My God. I mean, these are things I wasn't even considering. Um, but specifically, let's talk about Bells of Notre Dame, the opening. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. in the, animated film it's basically identical to that except clopin who is the narrator is not a goofy clown figure but a hermit retailing the dailies of his youth when he was actually happy um which is a choice and do you recall andrew how the opening of the american version of the show is because it's very different and significantly worse (laughs) oh god I remember we had complaints about it, and I, I think I remember saying that I liked the movie better. It is. But I'll be honest, I can't remember exactly a the A six-minute backstory for Frollo alone about how he and his brother- Oh my god, that's right. It's him and his brother in that shit. And his brother that is so Quasimodo's oh, yeah. father. Quasimodo's the nephew, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, it's that is, it, it makes the entire story worse. Uh, and it, because of it, it loses the power. Like this is such a punchy opening where mm-hmm. he murders someone, instantly regrets it, and has to atone for his sins. And mm-hmm. I think the biggest issue with that newer production is they really center in as Frollo, almost as the co-lead with Quasimodo, and it diminishes. It doesn't really make sense. Like Frollo is just—he's a villain. Yeah, you know? <laughs> and this I mean, I, sees I, him like, as a villain. <laughs> well, that's the—that's the thing I really like about Hunchback just like in terms of like literary themes is that in many ways, Frollo and Quasimodo are similar. Yes. Right. And they deal with a lot of the same issues. They deal with a lot of the same problems in a a broad sort of sense. And like, Oh, I can't remember what it is, but it's like, it's after, after Quasimodo goes back to Notre Dame after the fools, everything. Yeah. It's the heaven's light hellfire thing. where literally Quasimodo like succeeds his, save role you know and he manages to be like the good guy and Frollo doesn't Frollo fails they take like two divergent paths and so in order to like express that you need to have two characters who are otherwise dealing with very similar issues and when you when you add that twist to Frollo and you put that extra weight to it Frollo and Quasimodo aren't dealing with the same thing and so their reactions aren't balanced and so the criticism or the critique the narrative everything doesn't work but yeah no i completely agree well i mean they sing the same song in a way yeah the heaven's light hellfire Hellfire is Mm -hmm. the same i think it's like the same melody or something like that yeah a lot of the motivic information is is yeah yeah it's really Um, cool oh yeah i mean this is this is just one of the best disney scores like it doesn't really matter what version this is one Mm -hmm. of the best versions of it Mm -hmm. but like it it almost doesn't matter what version it is because it's always good (laughs) there there are (laughs) things that they do in this stage show that have always bugged me about Disney movies and they pulled it off really well on the stage. And like it's what? toward the it's it well, it's basically all the ending. Um I call I, I always call it Mulan syndrome because uh basically once you get halfway through Mulan, there's no more numbers. Mm-hmm. There's no singing, there's like nothing. And that happens We've a lot. talked about that before. Yeah. Like there's in Disney movies, the second half is always like action and stuff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So when they go to put them on stage there's always like, well, how do we fill 
all of this and you end up with a very lopsided uh, exactly like how do you have the just, musical yeah like how, <laughs> how, how do you have an act two right how do you have an 11 o'clock number when a lot of these disney movies especially the renaissance films have no have very very little musical numbers in the second half like hunchback's a really great example because the entire second half of the film it's it's got a really great orchestral score to it mm-hmm. like i absolutely love it it's fantastic but it's not musical numbers and it's a musical film you know I, no i mean you're right i will you're say that right. hunchback works a little bit for me because they give you a reprise of the opening number and almost no disney film will give you that but that animated film does give you that True. and that's why that True. has like one of the more powerful endings of any disney film oh absolutely like without question um yeah. Ethan, I know this name means something to you, but I'm curious, Andrew, what, when I say James Lapine, who is that to you? Um, I vaguely know the name, mm. but I really couldn't tell you. Director of Falsettos, In- Into the Woods, writer of Into the Woods, Passion, mm-hmm. um, yep. one of the yes. most prolific okay. uh, Broadway directors and writers of all time. And yeah. when he was tapped to write this and adapt the film into darker, more intense source material, or and take from the Victor Huger thing. He threads that line very well of both having a good night at the theater, but having emotional palatability that really hits home. Um, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I think that he, even his book has jokes in it. Like he's not trying to avoid humor. He's not trying to avoid levity. He is trying to tell the best story ever. There's mm-hmm. a sto- There's an anecdote that he tells in his book, uh, putting it together about putting the show to- on um, he did like, I think it was like the first preview and Michael Eisner came and saw it and he sat through it, comes up to James Lapine afterwards and he's like, you know, if Quasi ended up with a girl, we'd make twice as much. <laughs> <And that's, laughs> Come on. That sounds like uh, something he'd say. <laughs> and he's like, that's, that's what it is. Um, and he's very proud of the work he did on this, but I'm, I think that further productions mostly are worse off because he was not involved. Um, and but that might also be my bias. I grew up with this. I was obsessed mm-hmm. with this German album that I had imported in because it was impossible to get in America. I mm-hmm. had to translate everything. I looked up the book. I had to figure read the the translated script along with the bootlegs, along with it to figure out what's going on and learn all these new songs. And I fell in love with this production and thought it was basically as close to perfect as it can be. Wished it would come to America. And when it does, they, they, they kind of butcher a lot of the things I really, really liked about this. So that is mm. my context for why I'm whining so much. Okay, so, so what, what do you like so much about this one? Because I feel like you've, let, you've asked us, but what, like, you're the one obsessed with it. Yeah, what, what did you, you gravitate toward it as a kid? <laughs> Well, like when you were when you were a kid and you had this album, were you watching the movie going, it's not the same? Kind of. It was something like that where I enjoyed the movie and I was, I saw that there was a Berlin production going on. This is like mid aughts, I want to say like two thousand five, two thousand six, around there. Mm-hmm. Um, and specifically, there was just incredible songs like "Made of Stone," which we are Stein, which is what it was originally called, performed mm-hmm. by one of the greatest vocalists in the world, Drew Sarich, who would perform on Broadway and Les Mis and do a lot of incredible American and British works, but his German stuff is incredible. And the problem is no one else could sing it like him, including the the American productions. They, in fact, bring down the last note significantly for every other production of that song. So oh. he goes, you know what? I'm going to indulge myself and do a little comparison for you guys. Okay. <laughs> Um, so here is Drew Sarich singing Made of Stone. And this was 16 years ago. This is the only um, English clip that existed of this song for so many years. And it's only the last little bit. So I watched this clip so many times. And now upon my own, never again to wonder what's out there.
So he was the original Quasi. He performed that on stage. Mm -hmm. Um, And then everyone was like, well, if we bring it to America, he has to do it. He has to do it. Um, Sure. And he probably just aged out of the role. And here is how it kind of sounds now. doesn't quite yeah. hit that right spot in my brain the way that that does and there's it's like that is not enough for me to dislike it but if you're taking the things that i think really kind of set it apart like the visual stylings the impressive vocals the um punchy narrative the effective comic relief the design choices and you just start withering it away it what is there left <laughs> mm-hmm. and what i'm discovering is not much because the score on its own, while good, has too many faults for me to like love it on its own. And if you're adding in narrative pieces like the kind of weird soap opera element of Frollo being Quasimodo's uncle, like things like that just kind of make it a less quality broth. Like it removes the bone from the broth. So all you got is like gross liquid. <laughs> um, so. That is what stresses me out so much, and I, I feel like most people have forgotten how good this show used to be and are just used to what it became because that's all they got. And mm. it goes on to the further issue of a lot of people ignoring European musicals, including to our own, like, we don't cover as many as we should, but... Wait, 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 wait. so wait, before, going, going back to sort of the adaptation there, mm-hmm. I have a question. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Dear Glockner. Yes. Right? That was 99? 99 to 2002. And then it came to the States in 2014? Yeah. It had a dry period for a few years where the Uh rights were kind of going like 500 different places. It was weird. Okay. I have a question, and this might explain some of the Frollo stuff. How much of this was influenced by Wicked? I can't say whether or not it was, but Wicked had some spectacle to it. (laughs) Yeah, like, well, like, we can, I just, like, you don't, I mean, I guess I can, uh, no, I can't, I can't think of a couple of musicals that have 11 o'clock numbers that are, like, that kind of showstopper, but really, it's like Adina Menzel, and you really think of someone just really going all out on stage, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, like, I wonder if that was maybe a part of it? They wanted yeah. Frollo to be more ambiguous? I don't, the only I, years I have for, like, in terms of the dry spell is in 2008, Schwartz said, we're working on it. And in 2010, Mankin said, we're working on getting an American adaptation with James Lapine's book somewhere. But then, they, Glockner. but then they threw out James Lapine's book, which it. Yeah. If you take James Lapine out of all these shows, you get much worse versions. Look yeah. at <laughs> look at the it's Sunday true. revival. Look at the Into the Woods revival. I like both mm. of them, but they aren't what they were. Yeah. There's a yeah, reason why yeah. William Finn keeps bringing Lapine with him. True. <laughs> I have very limited information. This is like a fifth. This is like a like a nine year period where no one knows what happened. So. Mm-hmm. They just sat on their like, hands adapting yeah. Tarzan and other shit that we've covered on this podcast and was yeah. much worse. Like just in production hell. Liz, just tell yeah. me how many other Disney films were adapted to stage in between the 99 production like like i can think of a couple right off the top of my head we got fucking tarzan we've got a uh, little mermaid we've got yeah. uh aladdin aladdin <laughs> all these things came to broadway before the one thing that makes sense and even more so there was pr- announced recently within the last five years that josh gad was producing and starring in a film live action version of the hunchback of notre dame and that was no. put, put on no. ice permanently no. by bob Iger, who said okay. i don't like that movie <laughs> it's Ref- it's like a triple negative it's, it's like it's not happening but for the wrong reasons yes and it's such a shame too because this is one of disney's best like musical yeah movies. oh but without like, question yeah disney yeah. doesn't like this movie though because it's too like edgy and they don't think it will sell or, or they don't think family it's not good for their image i don't know <laughs> like as like from where i'm sitting this is like either my second or my first in terms of menken's work 
because mm-hmm. th- I mean, the whole film start to finish is amazing. And then the stuff that he puts in, in this show also really, really good. Mm-hmm. I think it's probably my first. I think the music in this is so cohesive and it like I, you, I can listen to the entire album like straight through and it's just like, yeah, yeah, nice. absolutely. <laughs> It's time to compare our opinions to those of the real critics over on Letterboxd.com. It's time for Breviews Letterbox Game. One star, five star. Andrew, I want to play against Ethan. Why don't you re-reviews this time? Oh, this is the first time I've ever done this. Oh, I, yeah. know. Oh. I know. I know. feel the pressure. Ethan, do you remember how this game works? I do indeed. All, All right. right. For the audience at home, we, Andrew and Liz are going to read us real letterbox reviews, um, and we have to guess just based on the review alone whether they're a one star or five star. All right. Um, you guys lead. So, Andrew, who's, whose team are you on? Um, I want to be on uh, Ethan's team. All right, Liz, you and me. All right. Let's All go. Right. Ethan, you go first. Your name starts with an E. Okay. Andrew. All right, here we go. I'm uh, just going to read one. Let's see. What's also, a, what's this is of the one? Disney movie, just to be clear. Yeah, I mean, it's, the okay, letter, yeah. it's letterboxed. Yeah. All right. Bro got so horny for a woman, he had to burn down all of Paris. <laughs> five. Absolutely five. Oh, you fucking nailed it. Dead <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> All right, Jesse, you ready? I'm ready. Apart. All right. Quasimodo is a cuck. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Not inaccurate. Five? Yes. <laughs> oh my god. All right, all right. Let's see. Hmm. Ah, here we go. I had pasta salad while watching this. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Uh yeah, five. I mean, yeah. Pasta salad. That's Absolutely. obviously five. Yes. Delicious yeah. food. Liz, <laughs> that was a great one. Thank you. It, you. it was a it was a late addition to the ground. To That's the team. amazing. Perfect review, honestly. What, what more could you ask? It really is. <laughs> Alright, Jess, you ready? I'm always ready. Let's make a Disney movie about ethnic cleansing. <laughs> Again? Oh, God. <laughs> Not a second time. Not another one. <laughs> well, that is a one? Yes. Yeah! Alright. Alright, here we go. <clears throat> uh, looks like... Uh... I'm going to have to zoom in on this one. I think this is a a croissant emoji. Yes, it's a croissant Um, emoji. A croissant emoji. My God, croissant is. And then uh, another croissant emoji. Croissant eyes, motherfucker. Awesome. I'm going to give, oh, shit, five. Yeah? Croissant? Are we going to have a perfect game here? All right, are you ready, Jess? I'm ready. Why is he kind of? I assume they're talking about Frollo. I'm guessing. I have no idea. There's multiple five. men. Is this, is this the Twitter meme? Five for horny. The, yeah. Five Can correct for horny. Five. It's got right. I won. I won five. Five for horny. Two one. There's horny. a few people horny for Flip Frollo, and it kind of concerned me. I'm actually surprised there's not more horny people for Clopin. No, no one was horny for Clopin. Yeah, that's weird. That is weird. He yeah. hits that high note. That gets me horny. He does. I mean, he everyone only is clowns, horny for though. Esmeralda, right? Um, that's the like, plot of this movie. <laughs> That's yep, the plot of the, the movie. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm more hot right, for right. Beavis. <laughs> I love Kevin Klein. Kevin Klein's chest hair. My God. All right. This is in quotes. This is just like Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Uh, one. One star. That's right. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. Hey, this is my game. Because they don't like Carrie, I guess. Yeah, no. God, you remember a lot more of Carrie than I thought you did. That was surprising for me. Like, damn, that's wild. Ready? I'm ready. I'm sorry. I'm still in awe that Andrew was able to pull out a Carrie. That was our fifth episode or something. Sorry. The world according to Chris means. Okay. Okay. I like that. You describe that musical as it has some Sweeney Todd songs and some high school musical songs. Early days were fun. It's still kind of accurate. Oh my god. I don't even fully disagree with that. Still. All right, Liz. I'm so sorry. That's the way things are. You're fine. This usually happens. All right. Esmeralda was that girl. She was that girl. Isn't that a TV show? Um, five stars. Yes. Mm. All right, Andrew. 
Oh, is this? Are we on like our last ones here? Yeah, last three. Yeah. Are we tied? All right. I think we're tied. Apparently, yeah. yeah. Okay, so we got a tiebreaker then if we get these two right. Oh yeah. My God. All right. Uh, why does this go so hard? <laughs> five. Yeah, absolutely five. Yeah, of course. Nailed it. Yeah. Nailed it. Snailed it. All right, Jess, you ready? I'm ready. Frollo needs a therapist, because what the fuck? Yeah, <laughs> what the fuck? Uh, what the fuck? Five. I love these comments. That, is that not a five? That is a five. Okay. Tiebreaker! Okay. Oh oh, we have we a tiebreaker. This is, this, we, got we got all of them, and the tiebreaker might be the hardest one on the board. <laughs> it is oh the most God. difficult one all on right. the board. So, and we won't, I won't even tell you why it's difficult. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta buzz in, right? Is that the rule? Yeah, we have to do a buzz. buzz. So oh, I will have God. Andrew read it because he's better at reading these. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, my friend told me we look alike. Buzz. Yes. One. Yes. Yeah! <laughs> I beat it. I did it. <laughs> Once again oh, with the tiebreaker. It's a 50-50 chance. Just guess. <laughs> Just go for it. Oh, my God. That was good. And that ends the letterbox game. I'm getting carried away like Quasimodo at the end of the animated film. Hey, guys. Sorry to interrupt you in the middle of the show, but we've got a show to you. Today's show is brought to you by the extremely kind donations by our donors over at Patreon. Patreon's this wonderful place where you get to hang out with us and do cool shit. Um, we also have commentaries. One commentary where Ethan joined us. We think we talked about a goofy movie. That was a good time. Like, yeah, yeah that was a good time. We have more stuff coming in theory. Um, but also, you can see extended versions of this podcast um unedited you like our what do you call it episode our school of rock episode school of rock. andrew cut a good 50 minutes out of that which was comedy gold but would have literally sent us to the gulag if we had released it <laughs> yeah. no one's no one is allowed to listen to that except for people who pay us yeah yes. if you pay us you get to hear what yeah, uh, what is the issue? Um, but our current patrons are Melissa Goldman, Goldman Danielle Reddix, Justice Tampede, Ewan Casty, Monica Throw, Brent Black, Lathaniel Stacy Coombe, Joseph Evans Green, Marie Lou Choquette, John Vanels, Russ Walker, Meets Hall, Emily Gracie, Kyle Summers, Jen AC, Scoot in the Technicolor Dreamcoat, Liz Lim, Nothing is Certain Except Beth and Taxes, Desby and Roger Benjamin, Jessica T, Mitchell Young, Chai Teacup, Chris Marcote, Kiji Marie Anastasio, Trevi Joseph, Layla, RJ Narija, Julia McLennan, Bjorn Hermans, Toriana Frazier, Sammy, The Adequate Amount, Jacobson, Lyanna Morton, Kaylee Blazier, Cinemageddon Reviews, Villainous Miss, Sofiana Ali, The Omega Geek, Paige Pearson, Maddie Wargle, Elisa Erdman, Annalise Kotova, Sarah Denbleckier, Evan Ball, uh, Zachary Torres, Laura Morasso, Mara Forloin, Lisa L., Possessed Washing Machine, Rick, Nick Roten, Puffy Boy, Julia Hardy, Jay Kusia, Sydney Hicks, Annabelle, Billy Clifton, Andrew Wright, The Red Caboose, and Katie. They give us a little extra financial <laughs> support that helps us keep the lights on here at Musicals of Cheese. Um, yeah, come join them. It's a fun Discord server. Also, not that it's worth mentioning, but we do have a brand new review on iTunes that I, I think it's worth bringing up. Oh, so, God. This, oh, boy. Um, because oh boy. <laughs> we read all of our iTunes reviews, or our Apple Podcast reviews, whatever we're calling it this week, and this one was uh, just four days ago. From Caitlin, um, 1210. Um, they said with the title, the rent episode dot 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 is just atrocious. Why bother covering a show you don't like if you're just going to bash it the entire time? If some of the commentary was more objective, it might have at least been an entertaining listen. Um, Damn, I'll have a more objective opinion next time. My bad. Yeah, the third time we do a <laughs> rent episode. <laughs> the third time. Third. We've done two rent episodes already. We did our first one, which was our second episode ever, where we're like, hey, isn't this kind of stupid? And that was basically <laughs> the entire premise of the episode. And then after like a hundred or so episodes, we revisited, like, here's a more nuanced take. Like, here is like, can, can kind of contextualizing it and making you know why we have our opinions. And we still get so much shit for the first ep rent episode. But the problem is, I mostly stand by everything I said in it. <laughs> we had a we had a couple off color jokes we probably wouldn't make oh a hundred percent but aside from other that, than that i think most of the stuff we said i i would still agree with it I would just maybe say it in a smarter way yeah <laughs> but the the moral of the story is don't watch rent <laughs> Thank you.
We talked about a lot of these songs previously, like Bells of Notre Dame, obviously an incredible song, but let's talk mm-hmm. about the ones that are kind of only in this version of the show. Can I can I jump in, just go straight in? And, Hell yeah. And, yeah, and, and talk yeah, about, go for it. Uh, Someday is absolutely fucking amazing, and I am so happy that they managed yes. to put it in the stage show and have it come back at the very end of the show as kind of like a giant moral. It's sort of like Esmeralda's own 11 o'clock number. It's yes. amazing. I can't say enough good things about it. I Yeah. Was that in the American one? I feel like it wasn't. It Did was. It that? was. Mm. It was? Okay. But it's just, better just, in German. Well, just in case anybody listening doesn't know, um, when they were originally working or on this film, and this is really common when it comes to you know just musical movies in general, Mencken had Someday as Esmeralda's number instead of God Help, uh, the, God help, God the, help outcast. the Outcast. And it was sort of a last minute change. And so if you watch Hunchback of Notre Dame, the Disney version, the movie, in over the over the ending credits they play it yeah, somebody sings it I can't midler remember. midler yes that's right um and so it was really like a 50 50 as to which one was going to be esmeralda's um theme basically like her her song and they managed to put it in in this and it's breathtaking it's amazing like i don't have enough words to say how good it is to do listen that to <laughs> And it's mm-hmm. great that they kept both because I, I think God Help the Elscast is also a good song and they just they have them both in here. Yeah, like... absolutely. Yeah. And the context, <laughs> I, I also I, I like this version of Someday better because it's a duet and I feel like it builds on it into like this beautiful choral. So it starts as a solo, becomes a duet mm-hmm. and becomes an ensemble number slowly as her pyre gets built around her. It's such brilliant staging and what musical theater should be. I don't think it would have worked in the place of God help the outcast. It works brilliantly here. Something something I really, really like about it, and this comes from the world of opera. Like you can see Mozart doing this occasionally where um they'll sing an imitation. So Esmeralda will sing something and then Phoebus will sing something back. Mm. And it's like the same line or it's like slightly changed. But what it, it's sort of like music serving the text in that Esmeralda is the one who's sort of putting the idea out and then by Phoebus imitating it, he's the one who's receiving the idea mm-hmm. and then agreeing with her. And so it's very much like her changing people's minds one person at a time and in demonstrating that in the music. I mean, it's literally operatic. Like it's, it's, it is so cool. Yeah. It's beautiful. Um, but let's talk about um, a song that d- is in this one but did not make it into the American one really quickly, which is Out of Love, which is a song uh, that the gargoyles sing to Quasimodo and Phoebus about why they are going to work together to help Esmeralda. I think it's a really cute song. I think it's like Mm -hmm. a bit of like warm levity before the show goes really, really dark and embraces the darkness. In this place of Soldier's glove. I'm still the 
crown prince of outcast, outcast ready to, to be cast out if we're never out of love. It's kind of interesting that they keep a guy like you when they have this song, but <laughs> I think a guy yeah. like you is fine in this context where they don't overdo it with pop culture references, which is the mm-hmm. my biggest problem with the movie's interpretation of a guy like you is just all the pop cultural references. And my thing with a guy like you is that it's the one song that doesn't sound like it belongs in yes. the original like movie. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Like, the all of the rest of it has this mm-hmm. similar tone and feel. And then a guy like you is just this like jazzy number. And it's just like why every is this every time I think of <laughs> every time I think of a guy like you, I think of um, under the sea and the Little Mermaid because mm. they put that in and Ashman was talking about it because they needed an up number, right? Nothing yeah. was exciting, nothing was up tempo, and it seems like a it was a similar sort of situation for this, where it's like we need something fun, we need something jazzy, we need something that's going to make people move, or just not something ballad like, right? Um, but no, I completely agree on that. I feel like the number doesn't really. It it's sort of just shoved in there. It doesn't really have any kind of context necessarily. Like it doesn't need to exist. It doesn't do much to help Quasimodo. It doesn't do anything to really develop the characterization of the gargoyles. Um, but out of love does. Mm-hmm. And so by having out of love, you anchor their gargoyles and their position like in the story. And so it's okay to kind of have an ancillary number where they're just like dancing around like a guy like you. And so no, I com- okay. I completely agree. I think I think uh I, I, uh. Sorry, Out of Love. Yeah, no, I think Out of Love is like a really great addition. Yeah. As a quick correction, um, some names are formed by All for One, not Bette Midler. Bette Midler did a performance of God Help the Outcast. Oh, okay. Thank also, you. Also, it, it was for my Eternal on the UK soundtrack, All for One on the US soundtrack. So. All for One sounds like it. Like, okay. Is it like a boy band? Yeah, <laughs> uh, it is a boy band. Yes, it's American mm-hmm. male R and B art and pop group. Is this like when uh, Stevie Wonder did that Mulan song, and it's actually the best song on the entire soundtrack? Um, speaking of comparisons that make things look shitty, um, <laughs> let's talk about Hellfire for a moment. Uh huh. <laughs> what are we comparing that makes? Or are you comparing to the movie? <laughs> yes, or I the think the 2014 this, one. No matter what, Hellfire kind of looks funny on stage. Like you can't live up to what's going on in the film, and <laughs> the the American production doesn't even try. Sincerely, they just have him on stage. And just let him belt that song and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Here they try to embrace some of the film's imagery where Esmeralda ghostly comes down from the sky and yeah. falls like a little angel into his arms. And he's um, vocally, this is, inc- I really love how deep, like a deep belt that they give Frollo. Like the final She Will Burn, like bolts to the back of the theater. It is so mm-hmm. great. Um, just the visuals don't live up to it. But have you either of you? I don't know how you top the movie. You though. can't. Like that yeah, anime, you can't that, top that. That sequence is like the best sequence Disney's maybe maybe ever made. Ever. <laughs> yeah. No. I, yeah. When when I was talking about um, arrangement and orchestration and how there are only a few times, like maybe two or three times, well, definitely two, maybe three, where um, all three of them were in Hellfire. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're like we're yeah we're not having we're not having access to that kind of like post production. Th- this was one of them. Um, this is this is where they included a lot of upper voices to try and make this make it sound more full. But unless you've got like 40 people chanting in the background, you just can't get that same vibe. It, it, and you literally can't there. do that on stage. Like, yeah, you're not yeah. going to be able to hire a cast that big. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, have either of you heard the demo for Hellfire and known what we could have had? I feel like I did once upon a time. It is not good. Um, and we're about to listen to it really quick. Oh, oh God. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Licentious crowd Then tell me, Maria Why I still see her dancing there Why her smoldering eyes still scorch my soul I feel her, I see her The sun caught in her raven hair Is burning in me out of all control Underneath my skin Hellfire What is this hellfire? My brain is boiling, boiling Driving me to sin <laughs> It's just the staccato <laughs> Like hellfire hell Wow. Um, it's like a tap number <laughs> to show what we came what could have been and what we started from makes you really appreciate what we ended up with and maybe that was the only reason I brought up Hellfire. Who knows? Oh my um, god, I'm not gonna be able to sleep tonight. I can't get over whatever the hell that was. <laughs> that was terrible. the that was much worse than I was expecting. To be honest, I, yeah, uh, like you know, you always gotta like you always kind of gotta <laughs> give it to him a little bit when it's a demo, you know. But yeah, wow, damn, terrible. Yeah. I'm gonna be. I'm a, I'm just gonna be a hundred percent okay. If that was something that I came up with and was sitting on my computer as a as like a sketch as a rough draft, I get it. I respect the process. Batman could not get me to release that to the public. <laughs> especially when you know that it's like one of the best songs ever. And yeah, then you're especially just like, you when you're what? putting yeah. it within that context. Let me put out this shitty they version of it. put Hang that on. on the soundtrack. The most recent, like, beautiful, beautiful, <laughs> like, <laughs> soundtrack. Yeah, but, well, that's the, that's the thing, right? It's like, like, there's a lot about, like, right, creating art where it's like, it's very personal. And because it's really personal... Like, no matter what you do, no matter how mm -hmm. distanced you try to make yourself from it, just because you're putting a part of yourself out there, there's parts of it that are just awkward and weird. And that's just what it means to, like, make stuff like I have. I have so many terrible jokes that never see the light of day and never will, even if you send Batman after me. But like, <laughs> God, that sucks that they would make him or make them, who, I guess, who do you but... think walked into the room and was like, hey, what if you uh, what if you did that? But you sang it so it wasn't like a, like a goofball comedy, you know? Like you saying it like normal instead of like hellfire, you know, like, <laughs> well, I, it's so that's, that's really interesting. Cause, um, heaven's light and hellfire, they're parallel in a lot of mm -hmm. ways, especially like motivically. And, um, that oh, hellfire do you think heaven's light used to be like heaven's light. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's, it's heaven's light, right? Da -da 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 right. So he leaps up. So that makes sense. It's like a it's a melodic ascent because he's going to heaven. So kind of makes sense to go like da 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 to try and invert that and have it go <laughs> down. Like I yeah. get where it's coming from, and I would want to hear what that sounds like too, but it just doesn't work. This is why we get Ethan on. They spit the knowledge. I learned so much right there. Um, it makes me curious. Um, I wish I could just show you more demos, but one of my favorite parts that I wish stayed in um the the production was in the there's a recurring theme in the musical called sanctuary i think in german is zuflut um where it's like in our sanctuary sanctuary like that is a recurring thing between frollo and quasimodo um right, and yeah. it extends out there to be like to give frollo two lines of plot backstory which is just like i was once as blessed as you i was a renowned in something basically saying i used to be a priest but then i saw the scourge of paris and decided i need to work in the law to get mm -hmm. them off which i'm like perfect you're a religious zealot that sets it up perfectly and mm -hmm. then the mm -hmm. new version makes him just a straight up priest because you know yeah yeah mm -hmm. no no i agree I, um yeah but in the original version of Out There, Frollo had a verse where he sings like the melody, Out There, they will hurt you or something like that. Like while Fro Quasi is saying like, I'm only a monster, which doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Like things like that. I, I am so interested by the creative process of how things eventually reach their final stage. Yeah. Um, and I well, love. Cause, cause... Sorry, go ahead. No, no, you go. Well, because so, in the movie, if I remember correctly, out there starts with Frollo. Yes. Right? 
Yes. And then uh, Quasimodo, it's, I don't know if it's like a Picardy third or what, but he, he basically modulates to the major key. Yes. And that's sort of that ambiguity where Frollo has that very like church mode, alien minor. It's very like dour. But then when Quasi sings it, there's like this hopeful cadence to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, and that's what Sanctuary feels like to me in, in, in the stage where you have uh, Zuflucht and then Dawson. Drausen. Drausen. <laughs> um, the thing is, we say it, but then you've got Drew Sarich like, Drausen. Mm-hmm. Like, he makes German sound beautiful. How does he do that? <laughs> it's a horrendous language. Every, la- every language has, like, huge problems when it comes to singing. Like, have you ever thought about how you would sing TH? Like, like, is there any way to hold that out? Like, it's a consonant sound, but it's just yeah. like, how did you, like, you know? No. Just, you know, yeah, how, but how do you do that? How do you do that in like really quick articulation? Like, that's tough. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, why we, that's why we always hold out vowels, really. Yeah. No, yeah, but what I'm, what I'm saying is like how, how, like if you have like a really complicated run and you have to like land on for something, that's tough. Yeah. Um, that right. is. And tough. then German has like oi, has all that back of the throat, like oigler kind mm. of stuff. Oi, you know? Well, actually, but they gave us polka, so we really can't complain. <laughs> <laughs> is that something to thank them for? It's like yes. thanking the Scots for bagpipes. Yeah. Oh, can you imagine bagpipe polka? <gasps> no, I don't want no, to. That's what I'm I sure wanna, that exists that's already, and I'm scared to Google it. There is an Andrew Lloyd Webber polka where they just take all of his songs and put up to a polka. Um, I hate that. It's catchy. I, I like don't know. It. I think memory. I think memory as a polka would actually improve <laughs> the song drastically. <laughs> what is our overall thoughts on Der Glockner von Notre Dame and our cheese ratings? Andrew, why don't you go first? Well, I, I mean, I think I say this every time we talk about Hunchback because we talk about it a lot for some reason. It's really good. This is the best stage version. I think we've said this before, but it's true. And now that I've seen the entire thing, yeah, this is the best stage version. You should just you should just find it and and watch it. You mm-hmm. just should. Yeah. Um, as far as a cheese rating, I mean, I'm gonna give it some sort of German cheese that I won't be able to pronounce. <laughs> let's uh, let's pick one. Uh, how about uh, be Benkowski or something like that? I, it, <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Mil Milbenkasi. That sounds good. Mil- is it Kesa? K a s e. It's K a, but with the two dots. Yeah. S e. Yeah. Kesa is cheese in German. Quesa, that makes sense. Oh. Yeah. So Milben Quesa. Mm-hmm. I like that. I like yeah. that. All right. Um, all right, Ethan, how about you? I I was pleasantly surprised. This is this is really, really, really good. I, I would put it adjacent to the very famous Lion King production that everybody knows and loves. Mm-hmm. Um uh, I, I yeah, thank you for opening my eyes to it. I will say that this is something I'll definitely revisit. Um, I agree, criminally underrated. It is a travesty that it didn't just get to translate over the Atlantic. So we didn't get to see it. Um, I really can't say anything. I like, you know, and, and that's the thing is like, we didn't even get to everything about it. Cause there's no. so many cool things to talk about. Like they have a projection of the no, the front doors of Notre Dame. And so when they have a battering ram, the actors cast huge shadows on the door and it's intimidating and it's wonderful. Uh, yeah no I, and I, I, they get the puppet show imagery from the movie with shadows and it looks yeah the reveal of quasimodo is such a beautiful build-up yeah, you see his absolutely. silhouette first and then he jumps in and he grabs a bell and it's a moment it's there's so many incredible it's, theatrical moments in this it's really 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 good like it really is that good like it deserves all the <laughs> raving you know it's just like it yeah no it's 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 that we didn't good. talk a thing about the risers how every time you're like mm. oh fuck that's really high up there y'all yeah. or like how they had uh how they portrayed like what the molten lead that they were pouring off mm-hmm. of the ramparts right the like the smoke. way they made that look with the with the smoke and the lighting yeah no absolutely truly no, perfect brilliant. theater Brilliant. Instead, Absolutely we brilliant. got the uh, we got the lamest set in all of the universe over in the states. Yeah, <laughs> it was like it was like a square. <laughs> it was like, a like a box, yeah. a box with a checkerboard on stage. I remember or was... they would just when they needed to go around things, they would just pretend to be statues and they'd move around the actors. <laughs> <laughs> and when they poured more molten lead, it was like a little ribbon that came <laughs> out of his sleeves. 
Oh, oh, so cute. Yeah. cute. Just like why, like what we couldn't spend more than five dollars on this show. Like it's Disney. It's Disney, come on. Like, what the fuck? Disney. Okay, <laughs> the reason why Disney didn't transfer that one to Broadway is because they thought it was too expensive, so they transferred Frozen instead. Yeah, and Frozen <laughs> sucked balls. The <laughs> one good thing about Frozen the musical is the poster. <laughs> that is literally the one thing I like about that show. <laughs> the poster. Oh, Get up. <laughs> Um, the graphic designer did a great no, job. No, seriously. So I got it right here. So if you look at the corner of the snowflakes, it's Elsa's face. If you look in the middle of the snowflake, it's Elsa. It's Elsa in every part of the poster, like hidden, like in five oh, different places. That's cool. I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah, like that no, is the okay. only thing I like about Frozen the Musical. I had to pull up my puzzle to show. <laughs> you don't like that they moved the like third song to be the. Uh, the mid show. Yeah, so you have a really, <laughs> really weirdly long first act that just never seems to end. <laughs> Damn, nothing's uh, happened for a long time. Yeah, they, they're still just looking for Elsa. That's weird. <laughs> um, Ethan, did you give a cheese rating yet? He did not. I found what I think might be the cheesiest cheese for this, for Der Glockner von Notre Dame, because apparently there is a Notre Dame Brie. Hey, hey. Apparently, hey! Apparently, there is a brie that they make in Notre Dame, and it's like a thing. It's a delicacy. Oh, there right. you go. Um, all right, Liz, how about you? Uh, I am a huge fan of the original movie. Like, it's my basically my I think it's my all time favorite animated movie, despite the gargoyles existing. Uh, it has such <laughs> high highs, I can like kind of forgive it. Mm-hmm. Um, also, I grew up Catholic, so that movie scares me inherently. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know uh and i really like this production it does a lot well the songs are great um once you i mean initially german's such an aggressive language so the first time here it's just like calm <laughs> it's like ooh. but i really did enjoy it the staging's great uh and i highly recommend checking this out i haven't seen the 2014 one um caveat i don't have any comparisons to the bad one that everyone's talking about i haven't seen it, unfortunately but I won't Maybe even I'll say check it out a, to like this one better. I so. won't even say it's bad. It's just nowhere near as good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the, it's really more of an issue of like, it just doesn't live up to this at all. It doesn't translate over to the US. Yeah. Um, Give, so, the, set, the set is laughably bad. Yeah. I was watching it on mute while you guys were talking. It kind of looks hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to give this... Butter kaze, which translates to butter cheese. Yes. Which is a semi soft milk cheese that's moderately popular in Europe. Moderately. <laughs> moderately. But I just thought it was a funny name. Uh, moderately popular. Incredible. I love German cheeses. They have such good names. Butter kaze. Butter kaze. Um, I have been simping for this show for multiple decades at this point. I fucking love it. It is my shit. It is the most my shit. Um, it makes me sad that we never got anything like this in English language, but it makes me appreciate what it had and makes me so glad that it didn't originate here in America because I've got a feeling they would turn it into the Little Mermaid. Um, that being said, <laughs> um, like because the Little Mermaid originally had a good like an interesting artist behind it, then they fired it, hired someone else, and then it became trash. Um. Mm -hmm. So I am giving this beer cheese served at the Marche Victor Hugo in Paris uh, because I'm still sticking around in Paris with Victor Hugo. Um, yeah, I love I love this story. I think it's done the best here. And honestly, just do something interesting again. Like I like you don't even need to replicate this. Just do something that can barter with this in some way. Mm -hmm. um, all right, this was a wonderful episode, Ethan. I know you've got some big stuff going on, but promote your stuff for the world. Uh, I make YouTube videos and I've been on a little bit of a hiatus, but I'm trying to get back on the horse at uh, Sideways. It's uh, my logo is a Sideways Alto Club. Um, I'm also on Twitter. Same name. Uh, have a great day. <laughs> <laughs> Ethan, did I ever tell you the story of how like my high school best friend who I had a huge falling out with? Try to extend the olive branch with me again by <laughs> screenshotting your Sweeney Todd video where you called out musicals with cheese. Oh, no. <laughs> Wait, who did this? One of my high school like best friend. We had a big falling out because of the 2016 election, um, of all things. Um, oh, wow. And the first time he talks to me in like five, six years, he's like, is this you? <laughs> <laughs> 
Is he still County. wearing the MAGA hat? <laughs> it was more complicated than that, but not that I know of. But I just, that is a wild thing that happened. And thank you, Ethan. I really appreciate yeah. it. Anytime, I, I think. Did you I, say yes? I yeah, did you, did you respond? I was like, yeah, that's me. Oh, you know that guy? I'm like, yeah, he's really nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, All right. You know who else got him? Uh, patrons. Oh, our patrons? wonderful patrons. Thank you guys for listening. Please follow us on Spotify and iTunes at Musicals with Cheese. We're on Twitter at Cheesy Musicals, Patreon Musicals with Cheese, Instagram Musicals with Cheese, YouTube page Musicals with Cheese. Our Patreon only podcast is Patreon with Cheese. Liz and I got some fun stuff cooking up there maybe one day. Email us at Musical Theater Lives on gmail.com. Our keeper of the cheese is Juliet Antonio. Ethan, why don't you give us some ASMR for Juliet? We do that with all of our guests. I've never done ASMR before. Oh. All you have to do is whisper. Just get really close know. to your mic and whisper. Just get really close. I am so uncomfortable right now. I don't even know how to begin to explain it. Beautiful. I do not. I do not feel. That randomly scream. That they love when you do that. Here's here's the sound of my mouse clicking. This is what it sounds like when I lose in League of Legends. Shit. Oh fuck. I'm going to come. <laughs> All right. This show is edited by Andrew DeWolf. Our theme song is created by Robin Nash of IOU Music UK. Thank you to the Broadway Podcast Network for keeping us on the platform and for not kicking us off for insulting the mouse. Because, you know, that, that's the biggest problem out there is insulting Mickey Mouse to his face. Um, All right. Is there anything else we have left to say? I'm just waiting for you to start trying to sing German inexplicably. We'll see you next time on Musicals <laughs> with Cheese. Drausen Morgens are the sign. Der Tabrig und Drausen, wo andere Menschen gein. Was Jubel gibt und Drausen, each muss um es zu sein. Heraus in der Natur, das gab Ross, Feldenflur, Trunken Schmaß, Don Ritter, und Nacktan. Ein Mel no will I she knows. Hey. Hey. That was really good. That was really good.